Hey, what's going on, everybody? Thanks a lot for joining us on another episode of Dr. Homebrew. We have David back, uh, my neighbor, apparently, uh, you know, next town over, not like direct neighbor, but, uh, you know, uh, David is a homebrewer and he was on last, last month. I forget which show or even what beer it was. Wasn't it a fest beer, David? Yeah, that was it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with a fest beer and now he's back with a wee heavy, which I mean, I don't know, man, when it rains, it pours. Sometimes we talk about styles that we don't normally get on this show. I don't remember Cooper. The last time we had a wee heavy. I don't know. Have we ever had a wee heavy? That's the other side of it, I guess. Maybe I would imagine in 200 and something shows we've done, we had to have had a Did wee we, heavy. Didn't we taste point. the, uh, like the Orkney skull splitter at one point as a commercial oh. beer or something? You guys actually had a, you got this wee heavy because last time you had a wee heavy, you gave the guy shit for only doing it because he needed to get rid of it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that's why. And that's why you got this one. Now it's coming back. Okay. <laughs> All right. And, and this is actually the last of it from the cake, so it worked. Oh, nice. Very cool, man. Very cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I like the style, um, personally. It's uh, it's not one that you, you see commercially, really, even, also. Um, hang on, I gotta find a thing. Yeah, episode 168, Scottish We Heavy and Katarina wow. Sour. I remember the Katarina sour, but yeah. <laughs> Those are two styles that are typically known to go together in a tasting flight. Right. You Again, know? not not something you get every day there. <laughs> I need to find this stupid doc, and I don't know why I can never find it. It's May, it was May 2020. Was I I was a Dr. Homebrew then, I believe. It was I remember a that early pandemic show, yeah. Yeah, I remember the Katarina Sour. I do not recall the Scottish Wee Heavy at all. I've forgotten a lot of things that happened during the pandemic. <laughs> well, I mean, it's still going on. So, yeah. And from before, yeah. yeah. I've blocked a lot of things out from the before times. Why can't I find this? Uh, okay, well, we'll just figure it out. Never mind, don't worry about it. No, nope, I got it. I got to do it. I'm a stupid guy. I okay. I got to read it. So give me a, just give me a second here, everybody shared with me shared with me <laughs> love the there the gold is. golden teenage mutant ninja golden girls shirt jp oh, thanks man well i'm just noticing that thank yeah. you for being a friend <laughs> and it's got the golden girls all with like their sword like their swords what and their tortoise say. shells that's pretty cool yeah yeah let's see van right all right betty okay, white would totally kill <laughs> she she would stab a bitch straight up Sure, she probably would. Uh, before we get to Dave's beer, though, I do want to thank our show sponsor, Five Star Chemicals. You go to fivestarchemicals.com right now, today, immediately, if not sooner, and learn about the best ways to clean and sanitize your home brewing equipment, which is, of course, using Five Star Chemicals. And while you're there, while you're there on their website, sign up for their homebrew club program. If you want to test out new products from Five Star before they're even on the market, or if you want free monthly educational sessions to up your homebrew game, check it out. It's free. They don't want anything from you. You just got to sign up. And that's it. So 5 Check it out. Sign up for that class. Or for, um, the program, the homebrew club program. Not the class, but, uh, you know, they do have classes. And uh, check it out. See how you can improve your beer. And then send it to us. That's the thing. That's the synergy right here. You gotta if send it if to we're us. using the word synergy, have we jumped the shark? No. Every time I I uh, hear the word synergy, I always remember John Plisse, uh, uh, his band uh, called Synergy. Really? He he has a band called Synergy. He did. I mean, I don't. You know, it was like him and his friend uh, Ron, uh, I guess I think was his name or whatever. And um, you know, John Plisse, years ago, years ago. That's pretty what? cool. I don't wonder what that guy's doing sometimes. I think about John every now and then. <laughs> when I was listening to the session way back in the day, long before I met you, JP, yeah. I thought the two of you were the same guy because you were JP and he was Jonathan mm -hmm. Plisse. Yeah. So he's JP. So I thought you were the same person for like <laughs> a minute. <laughs> uh, I, I get that. I get also um, John Palmer. People <laughs> thought I was John Palmer. So they would like write in, like, dude, I love you on the show. You're so good. I'm like, oh, cool. 
this is a nice email to get. <clears throat> if I send you my book, or, will you sign it? I'm like, why would you want me to sign? Oh, the other part. Yeah, okay, got it. All right, thanks, asshole. <laughs> yes, I will sign your book also. <laughs> I yeah, I think any, any of us will sign any book you want to send us. You know, ship it to us. Sure, give us some dude. return posters. We'll sign whatever you want. Yeah. Right? I'll sign everybody's name if you want. I don't really care. Yeah. I don't really give a shit about it. Um, all right. Well, what do you think? Let's, let's break into a wee heavy. Let's crack some skulls. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, David, is this something you've done before? No. No, first time. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to try the style, so I just brewed it. I like beers like this. I like getting... I mean... I like a lot of stuff, I guess, uh, when it comes to this show. But I sort of have a soft spot in my heart somewhere, my palate, I guess, for, for brand new first attempts at styles. I don't know why. I think maybe that's just like the home brewer in me, right? Where it's like, I can really relate to that, to like, kind of a shot in the dark. I don't know, you know, what's going on. So Getting to know you. Yeah. Well, mm. How did you prepare her for the beer? Did you read a couple of the recipes or how did you, how do you tackle a style you've never done before? Uh, brewing classic styles. Okay. All right. That's hey, basically man. it. That's, that's all, pretty much all you need to do. Yeah. yeah. Step one, find out what Jamil said. Step two, do, <laughs> do it. Do what Jamil said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Step three, profit. Yes. Um, Cooper, why don't you go ahead and start? I can see you're, you're already <clears throat> pouring the beer. You're ready I've, for this. I poured the beer and I'm ready for this. Yes. Um, so David's we heavy. Yeah, it's a um, category 17 C if you want to follow along in the guidelines. Um, so not a nice low hiss upon opening. Um, in the aroma, I'm getting pleasantly malty with medium light caramel. In the nose, I felt like I got something a little fruity, um, like a, a low, well, there's obviously something fruity in there, but it's like coming across as kind of like a, a low bruised banana like fruitiness. Hmm. Um, or just kind of like banana peel that's gotten a little older. But um, that fruitiness is kind of interesting to me, and it doesn't seem to fit with the, the style super well. But um, otherwise, I didn't get any diacetyl, um, anything else really bad sticking out here. Uh, it's got a, a bit of a bread crust-like maltiness. Low hop, noted only, just a faint little earthiness there in the background. Um. I'm just smelling the nose. I'm getting a lot of fruitiness and that little earthiness and some some maltiness, but I think I want more on the malt side. Um, there's also, to me, there's no obvious alcohol sticking out in the nose. If there, you know, if there is, it's really deceptive and smooth and out of the way. But uh, you know, not a bad appearance. Eight out of twelve or um, aroma. Uh, appearance wise, it's copper colored beer. Really nice, pretty beer actually. Uh, a medium light tan head persists quite well. No, no legs or anything. You can kind of tell the strength sometime, get a clue about the strength anyway, from that. Um, some of these will throw up legs. The beer is quite clear. It just presents itself really well. Three out of three for appearance. Um, flavor wise. When I get in here, this is where I get, okay, this is richly malty with notes of caramel, treacle and low nuttiness. There's a little bit, I'm getting like a little maybe apricot, like fruity sweetness in here. It's kind of interesting, or maybe maybe a little banana-like, uh, but it seems less than what I was getting in the aroma. It's not standing out as much because all these flavors are kind of kicking in. Um, it doesn't have any of the, uh, you know, it can have a little smokiness if you use dark malts to color the beer, um, but that's okay. It doesn't need to have that, that kind of slightly smoky quality. And like guidelines will tell you many times that is not from peated malt. Do not try to make a wee heavy with peated malt. Obviously, David did not do that. Uh, that would stick <laughs> out job, like David. a sore right. thumb. Yeah. <laughs> Don't use like fuel heating materials to make your beer. Um, low esters. Again, not getting as much of the banana here, really. Uh, definitely get a little low alcohol in the flavor. But it's clean and smooth. Uh, Fermentation also seems likewise pretty clean, low bitterness just to balance. Um, it does have a malty quality that stays well into the aftertaste. It's that kind of bread crust like light caramel, kind of a darker, darker caramel type flavor. Um, 
light fruitiness, like golden raisins, I said. Just trying to be creative there. Um, yeah, the richness is definitely definitely better in the flavor. The balance is to the malt. And I'd say it, it finishes semi-sweet. Um, I landed at a 13 out of 20 on the flavor. Uh, Mouthfeel-wise, medium-bodied, almost to medium. Uh, to medium full, I meant. Um, seems just a bit light for the style. But okay, it could be on the lower end. Or again, maybe just very deceptive and well-hidden. <laughs> we'll see. Um, carbon dioxide is medium. The head sticks around for quite a while there, so it does, it does still, you know, kick up a little head and it keeps going. It's, it's not too prickly or effervescent though. You can go a little lower. Uh, well, you you want it to be kind of medium to medium high, I believe. Um, the has a pretty smooth alcohol warmth. No, no, it's not really syrupy or or overwhelming in the the body or the, the texture of the beer here. It's just, um, you know, feels like a, a good beer, but do, it doesn't scream, wow, this is a strong, uh, a strong one. Um, so, uh, well, I, I landed a three out of five for, for mouthfeel. I think that I thought, even though it, it, it does kick up a little carbonation, it's supposed to be medium to high. And this one was a little towards medium, medium low. But and then just that it felt light for the style, and that's why I kicked it down a little bit there. Um, a nicely rich Scottish ale uh, that delivers a pleasant maltiness in the flavor. Uh, there's something in the aroma that's a little odd or a little lighter malt wise than I than I want, and the, or maybe this kind of bruised fruit thing is getting in the way a little bit. It really only detracts a bit though. Um, but you could just go a little bit firmer with this, go a little heavier. And you could get away with it very easily. Um, I think I would like it slightly drier in the finish. It's not cloying, but uh, it does linger in you know a lot in the aftertaste. That sweetness. Um, otherwise, it's a really clean, well-crafted beer. I gave it seven out of ten for overall impression, and landed at a thirty-four on the on the total score. So very drinkable, and you know, just uh, you know, it's very in the very good category. Just needs a little tweaking here and there to get get up to towards a forty or, or higher, but very very tasty for a first uh, try at that beer. Yeah, awesome. All right, Shar, go ahead. Excellent. Yeah, David, thank you for sharing this beer. Uh, you've been on the show before, but as you know, I always ask the question: Are you in a homebrew club? No, nope, lone wolf in it. All right, good for you. Don't get any watch lists. That's always a good good advice. Uh, but you know, don't get on a watch list. Do keep making this. This is good. Uh, so I uh, uh, start off with the aroma. I largely echo what Cooper had to say, and I will be curious to discuss our differences later. Uh, aroma, I thought it was uh, malty at a high level with caramel, bread crust, and toffee notes. No hop aroma, no off aromas. Uh, as it warmed, I did get a little of the fruitiness that Cooper was talking about. I don't know that I would call it the bruised banana, but I got a, a light fruity character and also a little bit of minerality, which is which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. But I noted just a hint of, of mineral uh, appearance. So it was eight uh, out of 12 for aroma appearance, three out of three. Uh, this beer is crystal clear. Uh, there's a medium ivory head that's a uh, very persistent and it's a light copper color. Uh, flavor. Initially, I thought it was malt focused with uh, some bready and low caramel notes. Uh, I got like a low, low amount of roast. And this is not a roasty beer, but a low roast roast character is appropriate for this style. Uh, it's optional. It's not required, but it's OK. Bitterness comes up the balance mid palate. Uh, the finish is long and balanced actually to me a little bit toward bitterness and not the malt. Uh, I thought this beer was really well attenuated, very dry. Uh, it I had a note here was missing a fruity uh, and ethanol character. As it warmed up, I got some fruit, but like Cooper was saying, I never quite got that sweet ethanol. Uh, in a style like this, it's supposed to be a high alcohol style. You shouldn't have like the the fusels, the harsh alcohol. It shouldn't be a harsh note, but you should get some ethanol sweetness. Uh -huh. You say, yeah, there's some alcohol here. And can you hear that dog in the background? That's uh, 
Yes. Yeah, I, I can't do anything about that. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, he's, uh, he's a little yippy. She's a little yippy girl. Uh, so I give that 12 out of 20 for flavor. Uh, Mouthfeel, uh, medium body, medium carbonation. Uh, I didn't get any warming out of this beer, so I knocked a point off for that. Uh, a wee heavy doesn't have to be an alcohol bomb. It doesn't have to be you know, like you're drinking just straight up ethanol, but there should be a little bit of a warming character that is to this that I, I wasn't getting. Uh, a little more creamy than astringent. Uh, a little bit more body would be desirable too. Uh, I still give that four to five for mouthfeel. Overall impression, six for a total of 33. Uh, I really liked personally the dryness and the attenuation of this beer, but I think that's kind of what took it a little bit out of style for me. Uh, a wee heavy doesn't have to be cloying, but it needs to be a little, I think a little sweeter, have a little, be a little more malt focused and have a little more warming than, than this one does. Uh, you know, what, what I, I've brewed wee heavies before and the advice that I had gotten, which I mean, sure you could, everyone can do things differently. So you want to retain some, some long chain unfermentables in this beer which is what gives you the body and a little bit of the sweetness. And when I would do a 10 gallon batch, I would take the first gallon, essentially. I would have the kettle already starting to heat up and I'd run off that first gallon of wort onto that hot kettle base. And it would start caramelizing and boiling down. And I would get that boiled down to almost like it was a syrup. And it was a really thick, wasn't a huge volume, but there was this thick syrupy liquid at the bottom. And then when I was done and I ran that off into the kettle or into the fermenter, uh, that part would be in the beer. It wouldn't ferment, but it would give you, with those long chain fermentables, the, uh, that body and that sweetness that this beer really needs. But uh, total score, again, 33. I thought it was really tasty. The issues that I had were not technical issues, maybe slightly more recipe issues. So thank you very much for sharing. All right, very good. Yeah, I mm-hmm. I agree with what you guys are saying. I I get a little kind of a honey thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah, the bruised banana peel is interesting because I got I, for some reason we have you know basically brown bananas at home. <laughs> they're just you know mm-hmm. they're just mushy, right? But and it sort of smells like that. Not like not in a classic like hyper banana pushy banana, but it's that that decaying like- sort of thing. Banana pudding or so, like yeah, you know, which something is like that. It is a, a good aromatic. It's not off putting, but I do think it's a little bit out of out of place. Uh, David, let's run through your recipe. Okay, and it is... uh, maybe we'll take a break and then we can figure out some of these phenols and where they're coming from. Okay, started out with uh, twenty pounds of pilsner, uh, one pound of crystal forty, eight ounces of honey malt. Four ounces of crystal 120, four ounces of Viking light malt, or chocolate malt. And I remember I did I did fuck up when I went to go buy the grease and I forgot the Munich. So Jamil has the Munich in his and I don't have mine. Ah. Then had an ounce and a half of EKG at uh, 17 IBUs and half ounce EKG for 2.1 at the end of the boil. And then fermented it with a big pitch of Scottish ale from uh, White Labs. Started out at 1080 and went down to 1016, uh, 8.6. Wow. What do you guys think? 1090 to 1016, yeah. No, 10, I, I, I can definitely, you, you were right on the ball with that honey, honey malt, JP. Mm, yeah. But yeah, that's that's really well attenuated. That's yeah. why it comes across to me as a really dry and well attenuated beer. Probably is because that that yeast. What yeast did you say you used to get? I'm sorry, the Scottish ale from White Labs. Well, and I love that yeast. I would all I use that for even like my American stouts. Uh, I, I often use the Scottish ale yeast because it would give a little bit of a smoky character. I thought this doesn't have that, but that's still that's a great yeast. Yeah, it doesn't taste like a ten sixteen. It tastes it tastes drier than that. It tastes like a ten oh six. Yeah, my comments were a little more towards the like I got some sweetness probably from that just the smooth alcohol that gives the impression of sweetness sometimes. But I yeah, got fermented it low, like a semi sweet impression out of it. 
it's not bone dry at all. But when you start that high, sometimes 1016 can feel a lot different than it feels when you start at 1055. <laughs> yeah. And this was brewed exactly a year ago, October 15th. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. That's some time to sit and age. Yeah. yeah. When it first was, when it was new, it was, it was kind of boozy and that mellowed up pretty quick, but it was well, boozy at first. The nice thing here is I'm not getting a lot of uh, like bad oxidation. There's no cardboard or papery quality to it, which is great. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, it did could you, age. Did you... Yeah, even longer, of course. <laughs> Has this been sitting in a keg? Did you bottle it right away? How How is it packaged? Yeah, no, it was in a keg until a couple weeks ago or a month ago when I bottled it for you guys. Well, and you still had it left. I mean, well, you said there's the last of it, right? Yeah, this is the last of it. This yeah. Right here, I got two bottles left. But. Okay, interesting. All right, yeah. Uh, let me. Let's. We're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna come back, and uh, I want to talk a little about the phenols and the the banana, and see where we can kind of dial that in, and and what other stuff we can uh, we can do here. So, hang on, everybody. It's Doctor Homebrew. We'll be right back. All right, thanks for hanging on, everybody. We're back, and what I want to do is sort of go through, uh, you know, unless we have any recipe issues or whatever we wanted to cover, um, talk a little bit about the that sort of bruised banana peel thing and, and what David can maybe do to, to eliminate some of that because it doesn't sound like it's a desirable uh, aromatic, right? What temperature was it for a minute at? You, pretty low, you said? or Yeah, it started out at like 64 and then went to 66. Okay, hmm. yeah. Bumped it up That's, to 68 at the end. Nothing really wrong there. I mean, you can ferment these a little cooler and it is... It is pretty cool up there in Scotland. <laughs> Traditionally, <laughs> you know, the, the farther north you go, the, the cooler the fermentation, I guess, in general, you know, or the, the more wintry a place is, you might have more lagers. It's just kind of an interesting phenomenon, you know, back in the old days, they didn't have all that temperature control stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, th I think that you could, you could go a little lower than you did <clears throat> to try to drive those asters down a bit. Um um phenols I don't, i'm not getting uh like phenols sometimes people get uh, phenols and esters mixed up but did yes. you get any like any that's what i'm doing okay spicy <laughs> like i mean sometimes in these beers you can get a, a smoky quality which is a phenolic and and i believe brian got some of that in this beer that is a phenolic category uh kind of an aromatic and um but i don't think that the the phenols are out of control in here that's definitely more fruity than it is like spicy or smoky so that that balance you could you know bring the fruit down and, and maybe some of that the malt richness might stand out a little bit better i, um, I think some of that what jason was thinking of was banana might be that honey malt yeah Al when almost I got, when always i'm a in fan of taking that honey malt out yeah mm -hmm. honey malt is cool in theory but it's hard to yeah, I don't know. You can accent some stuff. Like, I used to put it in my porter, um, and I felt like it accented some of the malt character a little bit. But if you have too much, how much did you have again, David? Uh, eight ounces. Yeah, that's, that's quite a bit, then, huh? Yeah, and this is a five gallon batch? Uh, six gallon, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, and I almost like maybe the beer's warming up. Maybe I'm fooling myself. Maybe it's this Heineken double zero I'm drinking also. But I, mm. I feel like I can taste, like I've just eaten honey malt. Like that malty, it's, it, first of all, it's a delicious grain. <laughs> I definitely recommend just eating handfuls of it. Um, it's my first it, time ever actually using it. It's very, very good. Throw on some yogurt, dude. Power down it. Uh, but I mean, I would, I would go like four ounces, maybe. It's very light. I, I would get rid of I would get rid of it, it altogether. But yeah, get rid of it altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems like a, a cheat to me in Jamil's recipe. Um, you know, the more traditional way to make it is to use a, you know, um, you know, a Scottish or UK malt, really good quality for malted uh, uh pale malt with a little little bit of roasted barley for color. And then you can use some crystal crystal malt to adjust the color a bit more and get it a little more radish, richer. Um, now you can also adjust the color by going stronger, which I, I would even suggest here too. Um, but, uh, I'll, I'll actually, you said you started at 10, 10, 90. That's kind no. of right in there. Yeah. No, it's 1080. 10, 
1080. 1080 yeah. is it is actually towards the low side. It can go up to like 11, uh, 30. So you can get get them up to uh, 10%. That is going to leave a little more sweetness in the in the finish and the body. But um, we both did kind of pick up on this one being a little bit lighter. And I, I agree with, with Brian there. It's uh, <clears throat> on the lighter side for, for body. So I would honestly agree with simplifying the recipe, just maybe take out some of the unnecessary malts. I don't know. I don't know that the, the Munich would have done you, done you any favors either. Sometimes it's just, it is a nice, you know, a way to cheat a little bit to use all, all these different kitchen sink malts and get it close to the right place. And it might impress a, a set of judges uh, if you do it really well. Um, but go go a little more traditional and try it uh you know just the, again just the roasted grains for color and a little smokiness that would come in and kind of play out balance off that sweetness and fruitiness that's there and then yeah you know get that rich color with just a little caramel rich dark caramel probably but i wouldn't go too heavy on that either but yeah what do you think about a simpler recipe guys i'm all for it i'm always for it less is more yeah i i tend yeah. to agree with jp that in most situations uh, unless you've got a real solid reason for having the ingredient there, I tend to prefer just taking it out. Which is the hard part about doing this. You know, we, mm -hmm. we like to homebrew because we like to futz with stuff. And it's almost like mm. there's so much energy put into making a batch of beer, whatever size it is, that you just want to you want to get all the flavors in your head out at the same time. You know, it's like, well, I'm doing it. I'm, let's try this and let's try it. And I still struggle with it. That's a, that is a temptation for sure. And I've, yeah. I've done the same thing. I'm guilty of that for sure. Yeah. Add and you feel like, that. yeah, I want to be creative, right? I want to be creative and try stuff. Uh, and it's not like, oh, I'm making the, I'm making lasagna for dinner, which I've made like once a month or once every couple of months for the last 30, 40 years of my life. And it's always about the same. And it's just, you know, you, you want to just try to have something fun and be creative, do something fun and be creative. And I, I get that impulse. And, the simplicity sometimes or the dialing it in or the simplicity factor maybe isn't as fun from that standpoint. It's not, maybe you're not being creative. Oh, I have all these 5,000 ingredients. I'm going to try to do this and this and make something brand new and great. But sometimes less, less is more like you're saying. Yeah. What do I you think, think David? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Brian. Go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, was I gonna, think. Yeah. You the, go ahead, Brian the, Cooper. Let's go. <laughs> you talk right now. Yes, basically, I need, to, I need you to talk, Brian. I was thinking Brian, that the, just talk. Okay, I keep getting interrupted when I start talking, but that's okay. The, uh, uh, the yeast that you used is great, and the um, you know, the way you treated it, I wanted to, to hear what you did for a yeast starter. It must have taken a pretty good big yeast starter to get this going properly, yeah. And happily. Yeah, two day starter, and then cold, let it crash overnight and dump the cold break, and then pitch some uh, of the wort in the starter and stir that back up and then pitch that and oxygenate. Yeah. I, and I don't think that, you know, I've done that cheat too, the, or the cheat, I keep calling everything a cheat, but the, the <laughs> concentrated and boiled wort. And I really don't think that that is traditional either for the beer. Um, it, it is a nice way to, to get some caramelization going, but they shouldn't be like super heavily like butterscotchy or, you know, it's, it's a scotch ale, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely going to be a little more on the alcohol and, you know, a little complexity from the dark malt, but, and a little complexity from the caramel, but not all from the boil. You know, you, you would probably use a, a longer boil to, to concentrate the wort overall, but, but not just boil a little tiny part of it and, and get it, burnt on the bottom of your kettle to a syrup <laughs> mm. it's a trick you can try it if you want to listen to brian but um <laughs> I, don't know. I, I didn't I have was, the i best kind of heard that that was what you like traditionally you know because in, in way back in the day they didn't have roasted malts they just had malt. they had one malt and to get the color you had to boil it longer to do that right but then again yeah. beer in the 1700s probably sucked ass <laughs> just because it happened doesn't mean that it was good i guess there's something that's, some, something to be said there yeah that's a good point that they didn't have style guidelines they didn't have beer judges 
They didn't have American Home Brewing Association, Brewers yeah. Association. It was just some dudes making some stuff that would get them fucked up. And <laughs> right. if as long as it was tolerable and it didn't make them sick, they're like, okay, that's that's cool. We'll drink it. Yeah, it's fine. Fuck it. Yeah. yeah. History with Brian Shaw. Uh, 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 this uh, is my version of drunk history. That's right. David, do you have uh, any questions for the guys? Uh, no, that sounds pretty good to me. Pretty good? All right. Yeah. We're done with David. We're going to cut him. We got to cut them loose. Send us some more beer sometime, brother. If you rebrew one of these, the Fest beer or this one, let's uh, let's do it again sometime. You're, yeah, you're I'm close. not doing another We Heavy. That was a one and done. Mm-hmm. No, you're never going to do it again. No, yeah. I just wanted to give you guys some content. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank, thank you so much. <laughs> you, so, did, you, did you not like it, David, or why won't you do it again? Just I, got, I got two little kids. I don't need a bunch of 9% beers on tap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's too much, too much for me. I like the five percent range nowadays. Yeah, mm. we see it happens, dude. Yeah, That's solid. I'm going to Pilsner next. I'll send you guys some of that. Yeah, do that. Nice. Solidarity Sounds in good. the East County with the fucking low alcohol beers, dude. That's what we got to do. Yeah, Four amazing. Legs always has a bunch on tap. You should check them out. Yeah, I keep hearing about it, and um, I never go over there. Yeah, I've only been a few times, but every time I go, they got a bunch of good low cal or low uh, alcohol beers. So, no, it's pretty sweet. Cool, right? That sounds awesome. All right, everybody, hang on real fast. We're going to uh, take a break. We're going to kick David out, and uh, we're going to come back, and we're going to do more homebrewing talk, or at least, you know, talk, talk on Dr. Homebrew. We'll be right back. All right, everybody, thanks for sticking around. We are going to diverge a little bit from tasting beers right now, and we're going to go into the thoughts and minds of beer judges while they are tasting beers. We're getting a little meta, and we're going to review some score sheets. Cooper, you have... Some score sheets there, right? What are we doing? What's what's today's lesson? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I just pulled up, you know, we this is what we work with day in and day out as beer judges. And, you know, it's kind of our medium for expressing thoughts to the brewers that are ent- entering their beers. Um, you know, it's clear that in different kinds of competitions, the brewers might have different goals as to what they want back out of a score sheet. And also just with the semantics of judging uh, very, very large competitions versus very small competitions. Uh, you know, you don't you don't have to use the 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 main BGCP score sheet as your competition's you know feedback to the entrant. You can use a checklist that you design yourself if you want. And there's there's a local competition that used used to be run in Stern Grove Park in in San Francisco. It was called Stern Grove. Now it's California State Homebrew Competition. And I think they're using more regular sheets now, but back in the day, they had this interesting little tiny spreadsheet, uh, little or spreadsheet score sheet that you'd give your feedback on. It was like the first time I had judged one where it wasn't just the regular score sheet, which I learned to write to write on. And later on, there there came to be a lot of other other sheets as well. There was, um, you know, at NHC the the early uh, 2010s, I believe it was, they started using the the um uh, checklist score sheet uh or maybe 2012 i think it was ish uh for you know to try to help the judges get through the beers faster but still give a lot of feedback so i kind of wanted to talk about the you know the pros and cons of each style of sheet and kind of the our preferences a little bit but um just what you know how how a judge can adapt to different uh, situations now not all of our entrants or people that listen to the show are judges but if you listen to the show enough, you kind of are, you, you know, the lingo, you know, the kind of feedback we give and, um, you know, score sheet is how we deliver it. So I've got my opinions about it. I'm sure Brian does as well. Hmm. Char, do you have I, opinions? I've never known you to have an opinion. <laughs> I, I do occasionally have opinions about stuff and things. Nice. Uh, and sometimes you'll be judging and you get thrown into an unfamiliar situation or you get presented with the type of score sheet or type of format of judging that you're not used to. And you just kind of, you've got to roll with the punches and, and deal with that. So I, I pulled up to what Brian was saying earlier, the 2011 uh, score sheet that they debuted for the, uh, the second round of homebrew con or actually home national homebrew competition. Mm-hmm. Uh, the con is always the con. The competition is always the competition. Uh, and yeah, what's interesting. We're old yeah. dogs. Sure. Is that we're, I, our, our, yeah, we can make, a, or, we can make that mistake. We're all right. Unlike that yippy dog that was in, in the background, That's who was right. a very young dog. Uh, and that one, Oh God, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a dog festival. You started right on it. cue. <laughs> you started it. 
It's a total dog festival. So what's interesting to me about the 2011 score sheet, I wish I could put this up on screen, but it's a podcast, so people will just listen to it. It is a checkbox orama. There's probably 100, 120 boxes you could check on this thing. And it's nuts because like aroma, there's a malt. There's a box for none. There's five boxes for low to high. And then a whole, pretty much every descriptor you could think of, uh, grainy, caramel, bready, uh, grassy, herbal, uh, grape, citrus, uh, lactic, smoke, spice, not to mention the uh, flaws. And the flaws were in a grid at the bottom of this thing. And there's and they're not boxes so much as little rectangles. And there's like three dozen of these with every single possible off flavor and aroma with a place to check whether it's there for the aroma or the flavor, and then to put a low, medium, or high. Mm. And I, I respect the uh, the effort that went into this because it's an attempt to capture the things that people would write by checking boxes. But there's just so very many boxes <laughs> that I'm not sure that it really helped people out a lot. Uh, and there really wasn't a place, aside from a, one little line for aroma and appearance, a little bit bigger area for flavor to talk about much of the detail. And I think that's why judges didn't didn't necessarily care for this one a lot. We're used to writing a lot. Yeah, the, but the check boxes a, too themselves are about two, you know, less than two millimeters across each. They're just uh, uh, tiny uh, little uh, check boxes uh, uh, that if you aren't careful in your accuracy, it'd be really easy to check the wrong one on there. <laughs> yeah, and let, let's face it: how many of us that are judging are like over forty? over 45 we got reading glasses glasses whatever and it's not always super easy to to pick all this stuff stuff out can't see uh, two flights into your competition uh, uh, the afternoon is going on you had a beer at lunch and here you are trying to check these little tiny boxes uh, strong american ale it'll be fine there's not a problem uh yeah we, we've all been there uh but regardless of the boxes i mean your job is to characterize this as best you can and it may not be in a format you're used to, but you do what you got to do. Uh, and I went to the BJCP website before the show, and I, I pulled that up. I also pulled up what they now call the structured uh, uh, score sheet, which is for the second round of national homebrew competition and up. Uh, and what's interesting to me is they they took most of the boxes out, except for a, a, there's a column of boxes that's in aroma that it goes down through aroma, appearance, flavor, mouthfeel, and they're all shaded gray. And they all, all of the gray shaded boxes are marked inappropriate. So you can check that box if something is there at an inappropriate level. And then there's places to write. And then the malt, malt essentially, there's a line with a, uh, a circle for none, and the line extends rightward. And there's a place you can check low, medium, or high. And it gives you sort of a more, I think, discretion about how to uh, how to characterize the beer. The flaws are off to the side like they always are. Uh, but they give you a nice list of common descriptors, which I really like. Because sometimes, even if you're an experienced judge, you're tasting something or smelling something. You're like, man, this this is great or this isn't great, but I don't quite know what it is. And sometimes if you just march through that list of descriptors, it can be really helpful to help you focus on what you're smelling or tasting that you can't quite put your finger on. Uh, and this Although is it's kind of like looking through a dictionary to come up with the first word for your great novel. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of words to sift through over there. And it's, I don't know. I personally don't find it as helpful as some might for a beginning judge where you're like, okay, I need a good descriptor for a malt. You know, if they're kind of grouped in families like that, that could help right. you. And they kind of are, I believe. But uh, yeah, I, I looked, I pulled up all these same sheets that you did here. Like this is the one you're looking at now. It's like, you know, it, that's a little bit better where you can check if something's a flaw. And it actually gives you a, a much more efficient way to say medium, medium high. Like I'm always trying to say, well, it's not quite medium and it's not quite medium high. It's like medium, medium high. Then you're mm -hmm. writing like six mm -hmm. words to describe the thing where if it's just a, you know, a, a line and you can draw the X anywhere on the line, it gives you a place to write it. So, you know, you're right. very descriptive on that front. It conveys you, a little bit. So more. you find it helpful as a judge. Do you find it helpful as a home brewer? I mean, I'm assuming you guys have gotten some of this back. 
Yeah. And I don't know that, you know, as a, as a judge or a home brewer, you could hone in on just, oh, just slightly one fraction of a millimeter to the left here on this line. And <laughs> then I, oh, I'll, I'll get a much better beer. Um, you know, I, I, I think they're more helpful than just the pure checkbox, you know, checkbox arama sheet. Um, and you can still write things. I, I do find it kind of constricting in that you can only write a little bit about each thing. And if you have to find, if you get a beer that has really complex malt and all you have is one line, that's about two and a half inches across to write everything about the malt. It's kind of constricting. And I have a hard time giving strong, confident enough feedback to that entry to tell him, okay, so but I might be writing into the margins or I'll do what I need to, to get that across when there is something important to convey, but you know, you just have to work with what you've got. I don't know if that, that there's a perfect way to make it, you know, I guess I'm kind of a purist in that I, I do prefer the classic score sheet myself. Um, and speaking of classic score sheets, I, I pulled up some even older, uh, older ones. I pulled up the beer score sheet from, you know, it's the 1997, 98 beer judge certification program. Mm. And our mailing list was the celebrator beer news in Hayward, California. And uh, oh my God, the celebrator. Yeah. I love that thing. So entrant, please note, please write to the BJCP with concerns or complaints about the appropriateness of uh, or tone of judges' <laughs> comments. Include copies of score sheets and that he has the a PO box in Hayward to send them to. I wonder what would happen if you sent something there now, like send some score sheets there from hey, this judge said my beer was crap and smelled like I don't know the, toilet the cleaner. Celebrator doesn't exist anymore, right? They no, went out of business. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah, so I wonder if I wonder if Tom I checked that. Got rid of the P.O. box. Yeah. yeah. You know, back, as, as a brief aside, I remember back in like the early 90s, mid or mid 90s, where if you wanted to go to some brew pubs and you were traveling or something like and you wanted to know what was there, you pretty much had to pick up the celebrator and then grab your paper map and figure out where you're going on the paper map to go find mm -hmm. the thing. Oh, sure. Right. There was no inter Internet on phones at that time. <laughs> no, no. But I, I think going back to these score sheets, like the more recent uh, second round and the National Homebrew Comp one is, is similar to GABF. Mm -hmm. I talked a little bit about GABF in one of the last shows we did. And the GABF score sheet, it's, prof it's professional judging for prof or judging for professional beer. It's a little bit different in format. What I kind of like that they do, it, it's laid out a lot like this more modern National Homebrew Comp second round sheet. But they've got the for their spectrum. There's like a box for in the middle that's expected for style, and then you go to the left for less, and to the right for more. You can put your X. So if things are all pretty much down the middle, you just check you know the X for everything right in the middle. But it can be then a little bit more difficult to then articulate. Well, what's really different about this beer? What's interesting or good or what stands out? Because if you're within that range of things that's expected and you're just marking that X, well, how is this a beer that's better or worse that should advance or not advance? And that, that can be a little more, more challenging. Yeah. And another thing that changed too from the earlier, like first round NHC and second round NHC sheets that were that kind of style, they had comments to the right of the little, you know, uh, descriptor box where you check the levels of things. And there was a line for malt, a line for hops, a line for fermentation. Well, now it just gives you a line for comments under each section. So you can comment about whatever you want in that aroma or flavor that you didn't be, you know, capture in the, the spectrum analysis of, okay, how far along the spectrum of maltiness mm -hmm. is it, et cetera. But it still is only like two lines for aroma, two lines for, you know, appearance, flavor, all of that. So I don't know. I guess I felt like, and then there's a feedback at the bottom, which has a couple more lines, but I, I actually got one of these sheets back to me. And we talk about how rare it is that the entrant actually does, you know, in the old days, they would mail it to the BGCP. And now they, they, you put your email address on there, or you can email the BGCP about a sheet if you want. <clears throat> but I got, actually got an email back uh, from, you know, NHC this year uh, from a guy named Josh and it, his email was really nice. He said, Hey, so glad you were able to judge my beer. I, you know, he asked me if I had the originals cause uh, the feedback was, 
was cut off on the bottom because I write too damn much. <laughs> and I'm writing down to the very bottom of the sheet no. and it's getting completely cut off. And I'm like, no, you. So I, I, I did my best to interpret what it did, the, the partial words that you could see the tops of. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, just a slight bit hoppier than some some style anyway but yeah I, you can I always him... run on the back of the sheet there's <laughs> nothing wrong with running in the back of the sheet no but that's the thing an an organizer won't copy that nine times out of ten they're yep, just sending them right. through a batch scanner the why feet, the entrant never gets the the sheet back that they just get seem an, cool an emailed copy that doesn't seem okay when we used to send those out i would scan them front and back which is why we stopped doing it because it was a fucking pain in the ass mm. yeah that's yeah. why i make a note over like in parenthesis and I guess the entrant could always ask for that back. So maybe it's a dick move for me to uh, still write on the back. I don't know. But this, the beer that Josh sent in, it did advance to the, um, the subsequent round. And of course, in an NHC, there's like four rounds for some beers. This this was a Munich um, You know, I gave it, I gave it really nice comments and it, it scored the, the top rating for the flight and went on for him. I don't know how it did in subsequent rounds, but uh, you know, he had brewed a nice beer and I wanted to give, Every entrant that got a sheet from me, good feedback. So I really did my best to work with this. I I don't prefer these kind of sheets, but I can work with them. And as a judge, you have to kind of be flexible. Do and you, as an entrant, if you ever have a question, well, you can write to the this the the judge, but they may yeah. very well not remember your specific beer, judging no, dozens of no entries. Well, yeah, and then day. weeks weeks ago too. Yeah, it's yeah, this like was you get six that months back, like an hour later. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you, when you, you don't prefer these sheets, why? Is it because that you, you like to give as much information as you do and you find it sort of a hindrance or what? Well, I guess I just like the, the prosaic nature of the language that you can use when writing a, a good sheet. It should, you should be able to listen to the words that the, when we're reading a sheet on this show mm -hmm. and tell what kind of what that beer should taste like. And this, it's just very formulaic and robotic malts. Just slightly before medium hops, just a little bit above medium low fermentation character. Well, it's got kind of medium to medium low fermentation character. And then all I could write there was cleanly lagered, pleasant floral herbal hop, no DMS. That's all I had room to write for the realm. I was like, and the, you know, the flavor is like fresh tasting, nice drinking Hellas with clean lagering, pleasant hop use. The use got cut off and good, clean pills malt flavor. You know, in yeah, the bottom. I, I yeah, it's just I, I gave as complete as I okay. could, but it was still it's I see still, what you're saying. I, I mean, want to say more about the beer. Yeah. Well, look, that's why you send beers to the show. And honestly, that was sort of the the impetus for this show is that you can't really get complete feedback on a sheet. And that was before they changed the sheets around. Yeah. You need to ask in my in my opinion, if you want to improve your beer, you need to be asking questions of your of of the person judging your beer. It's very hard to take the written word and go, okay, I'll do that, especially in a competition setting because you have not, it's not just one person, it's two people. And in my experience, oftentimes I would get conflicting information about roast is too light. You need more roast. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. where do you, what do you do with that? I mean, we, we disagreed a little bit on the sweetness, but we were able to kind of discuss it out on that, that beer we just had that we heavy. Yeah. Well, and then David yeah. was here to be able to ask like, well, how, you know, if he, if he, gave a shit it sounded like he just was brewing the the he just brewing it because but one like, off yeah we've had people go well, how do i do that how do mm -hmm. i adjust the sweetness or where can you know what i mean and, and ask those those uh independent questions yeah i think yeah. this beer could be made to be uh, even really you know it's very good as it is it could be made to be excellent with a few minor tweaks and you know i i maybe as his kids grow older he'll start needing stronger beers again we'll see go ahead Brian. sorry one thing i just wanted to say about the regular beer score sheet is and as a judge trainee you're trained to okay you must comment on the malt and the hops and the esters and the other aromatics everything that's listed here as you go through that it does it can be kind of formulaic there too you can just get a sheet that says medium malt with breadiness you know medium hop with the you know citrus it's you know it's like a recipe for writing a sheet for for certain kinds of beers but then you get a, something like a sour beer or a you know a fruited beer where you know or a belgian style beer sometimes we're all the you know it's all other families of aromatics that are coming in and if you just follow that same formula you're not going to do the beer uh, a good service you're gonna you're kind of kind of 
comment around the sides of what it really is. So as a good judge, what you what you need to do is to learn how to focus on beer appropriate style, appropriate comments for that beer. I know that a Belgian Saison should have a nice prickly phenolic, you know, uh, a spicy white pepper like character you sometimes along those kind of families in there. If you if you just breeze through and comment on fermentation characteristics, balance, finish, aftertaste, and don't mention anything about the, the pepperiness or the fruitiness of a Saison, you're missing the point of the beer, you know. So you gotta you gotta be able to or the sourness in a sour beer. It doesn't nowhere on here does it say comment on the sourness level of the beer. But if you get a sour, you damn well better, you know. <laughs> find a way to work it in yeah. work it and that's under other flavor flavor characteristics of course but you need to know how to do that and as you judge with other people and and read through some good score sheets you know mm-hmm. you learn how to do that sure what are you gonna say yeah and i i think that uh in general uh, just to kind of echo in, in a sense what brian was saying that when you're a judge you might get confronted with unexpected score sheets you might get confronted with like weird non-standard style guidelines you're not familiar with. At the end of the day, it's all about communicating what it is you're smelling and tasting and perceiving. And whether you do that by checking a box or making an X on a spectrum or writing a bunch of words down or whatever, I mean, your job is to is to perceive that and get that perception across in the manner that the competition organizer is trying to get you to do that. And it may not be what you're comfortable with or used to, but you can get comfortable with anything pretty pretty quickly as far as the your your score sheet format, and just keep an open mind and just go there with the intent to you know taste taste some beers, give some feedback, have a good time, and it'll all work out okay. There you go. Yeah, I mean that said, oh. if you do get to a competition where the the organizer is telling you to do something that's just completely wrong, and, and <laughs> you know, oh don't don't write more than one line per you know per. <laughs> aroma appearance flavor section just just do one line or two or three words that's all we need here we need to be quick so forget you judges etc yeah that'll never happen just mm. just fight back against that a little bit maybe yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's the type of, exactly I, I totally that's there's not an excuse for not communicating no matter how pressed for time you might be if anyone's giving you directions like that yeah you you need to push back on that for doesn't sure. mean you have to spend half an hour per beer <laughs> right uh, all right, everybody. I think that's it. We're going to take off. We're going to get ready for the next show. So thank you very much, David, for coming back on the show and giving us a beer we we rarely have. And apparently we've had it a lot more recently than, uh, than <laughs> anybody remembered. But that's okay. It's the nature yeah. of the game, man. It happens. All right, everyone. Take care. And until next time, we'll see you later. Oh, actually, uh, if you want to be on the show, if you want to send us beers, which you can do and you should do, Nay, you, it is your duty as a person with ears listening to this show. Email brian at thebrewingnetwork.com. The show doesn't exist unless you guys send us beers. Email brian at thebrewingnetwork.com. He'll get you on the rotor and uh, yes. we'll get you in here. And, uh, and you know. we're much better than any kind of score sheet that's out there. We're living, right. breathing score sheets. It's 25 minutes of, of you know, two on one, um, you know, hot homebrew action. And you can ask <laughs> a question or whatever. So it's, yes. uh, think of it like that. It's a free consultation. All it costs you is some beer and some shipping. But Attentive. if you're in the Bay Area, we will do our best to, um, you know, to meet you somewhere. But anyway. Is that, is that a category on Pornhub, JP? Like sure. the whole hot two-on-one judging action? Sure it is. Why Attentive, not? well-meaning judges are waiting for you. <laughs> yeah. we'll Only two ninety-nine a minute. And Call 1-900-JUDGE-YOUR-BEER. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot. We'll see you.